I would like to introduce Dr. William Burnett, who's a child psychiatrist and forensic psychiatrist from National, Nashville, Tennessee. He is the president of the Parental Alienation Study Group. And I'd also like to introduce Dr. Demosthenes Lorandos. He's both a psychologist and an attorney located in Michigan. His current project is uh, being the executive editor of the Litigator's Handbook of, on Forensic Medicine, Psychiatry, and, psych and Psychology, which is an encyclopedic three-volume set currently being published by Thompson Reuters West. They will now be presenting a history of the growth and evolution of our understanding of parental alienation theory, and it'll answer the following question, where have we been and where are we headed? Thanks, Larry. Okay, milestones. First milestone. Bill put my name on the bottom of the card so I would know it was me, my turn to talk. And he's told me I've got two minutes and there's a hard stop and, and Larry's gonna hold up a sign that says, stop, if I go beyond it. So here I go, Bill. All right. Okay. All right, so we know that parental alienation has been around for a long, long, long time. From King versus the Manville, Shelley versus Westbrook, uh, Earl of Westmeath. It's been popularized in the press. It's been uh, demonstrated in movies and in texts for many, many years before anyone heard of Richard Gardner. In fact, the smartest guy on the planet was a victim of parental alienation. And in a letter that, that Albert Einstein wrote to his friend, uh, Professor uh, Zanger, uh, he said, my fine boy had been alienated from me by my wife, who has a vengeful disposition. Okay, so I went back and found the letter and got my high school and comprehensive exam German dusted off and read it, and that is exactly what he said. Not pushed away from me, not kept from me, alienated from me. A popular movie in 1935 demonstrated the process of parental alienation, and in 1974, in a national publication, a nationally syndicated publication, we see poisoning the child's mind. So, so then we have David Levy. We, have, we heard a little bit about yesterday, William Reich, Louise Desper, all writing about parental alienation, using different phrases, but writing about the process of alienating a child from another parent. Two, still me, I know because Bill put my name on the bottom of the slide. Richard Gardner, so Richard Gardner comes along, he's a child psychiatrist like Dr. Burnett, and he's consulting on high conflict divorce cases. And when I was sitting in his, in his office in, in New Jersey, uh, back in 2001, 2002, something like that, he told me he was just gobsmacked at all these crazy allegations that were coming. He'd never seen anything like it. So he read the old stuff. He read the stuff about the Levy and Reich and people had said, and he, and he said, this is a cluster of behaviors. I'm seeing it over and over and over and over again. I'm seeing this cluster of behaviors. In medicine, in the past, we've called clusters of behaviors a syndrome. And what are they doing? They're alienating the kid. It's like brainwashing. But I don't want to use the term brainwashing because it's too crazy. So I figured that the best thing to do would be to say it's an alienation syndrome. And who's doing it? One parent is doing it. So I called it parental alienation syndrome. I said, Gee, that, that sounds realistic to me. So he formulated this idea about a group of behaviors where he saw the alienation, you know, a, a good relationship suddenly gone bad 
somebody acting badly, doing what we call PABs, parental alienating behaviors, and he wrote it up as a syndrome and published it in, in, uh, in the literature in the Academy Forum. And then he went on to publish an absolute ton, a ton of stuff. And he discovered, after he published three or four books, that, that, he, that, that he had a core audience. And if he had a core audience, why was he splitting the gelt with, with, with some publisher who had, didn't know anything about it? So he figured, I'll create my own publishing company and started publishing it out of his own publishing company. Same sorts of things. So at one point, I think it was 2004, 2000, something like that, I'm at his office in, in Creskill, New Jersey, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm there with my, my wife, Patricia, who's a cultural anthropologist, and she's tagging along, and we're meeting Richard Gardner, and uh, this guy that I told her about a lot and would call my office up and giggle on the phone to tell me jokes, and so we're, so we're there, and I see this cheesy little suit, little, little uh, briefcase, Samsonite briefcase, you know, those kind of uh, plastic ones with a little metal around them, and two two, two handheld dictating machines. And I yell, Patty, Patty, come here quick. Oh my God, Patty, come here quick. And Richard runs out of his consulting room, leaves the patient in there, runs out of his consulting room, goes, what, what? I said, look, we've arrived at the seat of the Gardner Publishing Empire. He goes, ah, cut it out. But he was, without a doubt, a major figure in trying to prevent terrible things happening to children in the context of high conflict divorce, high conflict separations of all kinds. And he was in it for the children. He didn't give two rips about the parents when it came right down to it. He was there for the children. And he told me that over and over and over and over again. And since that, that's why I got into this, also, when Richard died and we had the first book on parental alienation stopped because Richard Sauber and Richard Gardner had picked a publisher that I thought was bad news. And when Richard died, the whole, pro the whole project stopped. So Richard Sauber and I decided we're changing publishers and we're going to use the, the largesse, the, the track record of the American Journal of Family Therapy and all of the stuff that the American Journal of Family Therapy had been doing for many years and get ourselves a better publisher, a publisher that knew how to put out texts that were, were practical texts. They were texts that allowed teachers, firefighters, police officers, uh, school administrators uh, to understand what the tasks of their job were and give them the research to back up them trying to do the, a, a good job. And so. We, we also relied upon another person who was doing major work at the time in the, in the early 2000s, and that was obviously Richard Warshock, whose book has been translated over and over and over and over again. So, so Richard Sauber, Richard Warshock, and I pulled the first international handbook of parental alienation syndrome together. And why did we call it that? We called it that because that's what Richard called it. Richard said, and, and I believe that there's a good argument to be made for, calling it a syndrome, a cluster of behaviors. And, and as diagnosticians, when we're doing an assessment and trying to come to a diagnosis, we're looking for things that sort of hang together, and we're comparing it to other examples of similar behaviors. This is how we diagnose schizophrenia. This is how we diagnose borderline personality disorder. This is how we diagnose all sorts of things. We come to a diagnosis by looking at similarities. And the diagnostic nosology tells us that w you know, when we have this group of symptoms, this, this group of behaviors, this group of this kind of ideation, this, this, this kind of acting out, well, we call it that. So. We called it the International Handbook of Parental Alienation Syndrome. And we brought people together from all over the world. And we brought Christian Dum in from, from Europe. We brought, we, we capitalized on Sauber and on, and on the work 
that, that uh, Richard Gardner had done and, and, and that Richard Warshock had done, and, and, and I had a contribution to make as well. But we felt that this was foundational in saying, look, there's this group of behaviors that we, all of us in Europe, in Canada, in, in, in North America, that we are seeing replicated again and again and again with remarkable similarities. You know, there's a good relationship, somebody acts out, the relationship goes to heck in a handbasket, the kinds of things that the kids say about it don't make any sense at all and don't really correspond, et cetera, et cetera. And so we called it the International Handbook of Parental Alienation Syndrome and created the foundation for publishing internationally about this phenomenon. Thank you, Demos. So as you can see, we are giving you an overview of the history of this topic of parental alienation. And so we're covering two, 200 and some years, so it's about 20 years for every two minutes. So obviously, this is not a detailed analysis. This is an overview. And everything we've been saying was published this week in the new journal, uh, the, journal the European Journal of Parental Alienation practice, which I'll show you later. So one of the criticisms over and over again of our critics is that there's not a uniform system, there's not a uniform definition of parental alienation. So one of the things we've done to try to straighten that out is uh, Amy Baker and I devised uh, what has become the five-factor model. Initially, Amy had the four-factor model when Demos and I put together the, the book on science and law, we thought that we should add factor one. You all know the five factors. Factor one is the child doesn't want to see a parent. There's refusal. Two is previous good relationship. Three is absence of abuse. Four is alienating behaviors by the parent. Five are symptoms in the child. The, Amy and I did not make these up. These had been around since the 1980s, but what we did, we compiled them into one list that initially was the five-factor, and now the, the, the four-factor, and it's now the five-factor model. And one additional thing we did, so the, the issue is, is that model been accepted? So Amy and I did a survey of people on the ground, people who do child custody evaluations, and we asked them, do, uh, do you agree with this definition of alienation, of alienating parents, of target parents, et cetera, of estrangement, and there was 80 to 90 percent agreement. So we, th we think now we have a definition that's generally accepted. Incidentally, this article was published in the American Journal of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, wh which is the journal for child psychiatrists in the world. So here we go. We think we now have a definition. So in the meantime, there have been books published. There has been a flood of books published about this topic. And I've been keeping track of this for several years. And now, how many do you think I have? I have almost 200 books, some of them published by professionals for other professionals, many of them published by civilians or parents or even now formerly alienated children about their experiences. The, uh, it's just an amazing co compendium of these books here. I, I think I have a few more. The ones you've seen here were all written by members of this organization. Here we go. You know, I think you recognize some of these. Uh, some of them are by people who are speaking this week. So this is an amazing accomplishment over the last 20 years or so this enormous literature on this topic. I get this stuff all the time. In the last two weeks, I learned of three more books, <laughs> which I didn't know about. And when I get home, I'm going to add them to my big master list, which is on the PASG website, in case you want all this. So here we go. So an interesting uh, aspect of this movement in the last 20 years are you guys are these organizations, the child and family advocacy organizations. I think that's a unique aspect of a scholarly 
activity, that not only is there uh, all, the, all these stuff by PhDs and articles and books, but there's this enormous effort by uh, advocacy organizations. I, I hope you all recognize some of you. This, this list I'm showing you is not exhaustive. In fact, I, you know, obviously I had to pick and choose. Uh, whoops. Well, I'm sorry I missed part of it. Let's see if this comes up right. Yeah, so here are a few more. Um, and to me, this is a really important collaboration between the scholarly people and the advocacy people. Here's, here's the last one. This is in alphabetical order, but this last one happens to have PASG and PASI, PASI. We both have tables out here, so please uh, talk to those, to those folks. Let's see. International development. So from the beginning, this organization was not simply a local neighborhood event, that it involved people from uh, other countries. And I have a list here of, of events uh, and who was involved with it, with it. And let me, as you can see, a number of these people were PASG members or PASG founders. Now this only goes up to, uh, to it goes up to 2009. Th th these are the foundational people. Obviously there have been hundreds of people in Europe and Asia and Australia and South America since it, but the, I, I just listed these as kind of the pillars, the original foundation. And let me mention some of these. See number four, Ad Edward Bacalar from the Czech Republic. He was back in the 1990s, he was writing about parental alienation in Czech. And it's really amazing. He knew a little bit about Gardner and he found it in Prague in the Czech Republic. Abe, of course, is from Canada. Lena is, is a founder from Sweden. Guglielmo, which is Italian for William, <laughs> I learned, is a professor in Italy, in Milan, Italy. He's a big shot in forensic psychology in Italy. Ludwig Lowenstein, you may have heard of. He was a prolific writer in the United Kingdom, and he testified and, and made a name for himself and made many enemies in the, in the anti-PA movement in England. Gardner, of course, Wilfred uh, was a big promoter in Europe. And finally, let me mention this guy, Paul Ben Susan. He's a child psychiatrist in France uh, who did really, he had, had really important experiences. He was given the Legion of Honor Medal, Legion d'Honneur Medal by the government of, of France for his work as a forensic psychiatrist. I mean, that's pretty amazing that these people are pretty uh, I interesting people. Now, one really important event was when Richard Gardner gave this famous talk in Frankfurt on Main in 2002. Here he is. And that fellow I mentioned, which Richard uh, Wilfred von Bach Gallo, uh, published that event. It was put together, all the presentations were put together, and that was a seminal publication uh, on, on this topic. Oops. So this organization was essentially founded on April the 3rd, 2009 in Florence, Italy. And these are the people who were there that day. Some of the people I've just mentioned are in this picture. And here they are, you don't have to memorize all these names. But what I, what I wanna emphasize is the diversity of where they come from, Germany, Belgium, Finland, and so on. And my, that was a really important point from the very beginning. We sat, we had lunch together in Florence and we thought we need to put together an organization and that's how it got started. And those, those are the people who endorsed it, the initial members. So now we're gonna move, we're so, sort of on a lightning activity here and Demos will gonna take us ahead. Okay, I came to this out of being a clinical psychologist and quitting and going to law school to help protect children. And there are many ways to help protect children, not just in, in family court, but just, just to 
briefly summarize some of these things. I started confronting the memes that, well, this stuff is just junk science under the Daubert standard or the Mohan standard. It's just not admissible. It's, it, it's, just, not, it's just not admissible. It's, it's junk science. So I said, hmm, not admissible, huh? Okay, let me take that on. And so my team and I looked at parental alienation cases from 1985 through 2018 and applied an extremely strict inclusion exclusion criteria, much more, much stricter than normally would have happened, but we had folks writing in law review articles and so on and so forth that this, this concept of parental alienation, this construct, was just not admissible in court because it was junk science. Please. So. You are having a time issue. Yes. Yeah. So. <laughs> so we demonstrated, oh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. And this is, this is a chart showing the increase in parental alienation cases where it was found to be material to what's going on, probative of something that mattered, relevant to the case, not more prejudicial than probative, admissible, and had weight in a decision process. We looked at gender. We looked at who was doing this sort of thing. And certainly what we found was it was admissible. If anybody's seen my cousin Vinny, admissible. And in no case did the court take a child away from a protective parent and give the child to a, a violent parent. But there's different kinds of relief. There's tort relief for these kinds of cases. Tort remedies that I discussed in one of the, uh, in, in parental alienation science and law, false imprisonment, defamation, negligent investigation, conspiracy, intentional affliction of emotional distress, Experts all agree that it's admissible, it's child abuse, and the behaviors have to be dealt with. So what are the interventions? What do we do about this? Well, we published in our 2013 book uh, so, some writing from uh, a judge in British Columbia who had a pretty good handle on how to deal with this. Identify it early jump into this, make significant orders, et cetera. And we, we, we published her essay in the book because she had a good handle on this and it's the same rules that should be followed today. We, had, we found another judge in, uh, in family court in Chicago. She had an excellent orientation to dealing with and so we published her ideas about how to deal with this and what they wrote then is applicable today to how to deal with this. There are reunification programs. I studied the Family Bridges program and wrote a two-part uh, article about that. So there are many, many ways to deal with this. So another big deal is getting published in journals. And we have been very successful in getting really dozens and hundreds of important articles in high-quality journals. I, this, these are simply articles that have to do with psychological testing. There's whole other areas. But just to convey, and this is, this is my own thing that has to do with psychological testing, which was very convincing. This is that test called the PARC, the P-A-R-Q, that distinguishes alienated from non-alienated children, the red versus the blue. So even though we have won the battle for scholarly publications, we have been dealing with the misinformation. I'm afraid that the PA critics are ahead in terms of public relations, and that's something we're going to have to deal with in the future. Here's a huge misinformation that was published last year, this book um, about challenging parental alienation. Here's a huge misinformation that was published a month ago uh, at the United Nations that we're trying to deal with. And this is where it all comes from. It's interesting, this is not random misinformation. Most of it comes from one journal, the Journal of Child Custody. It's just kind of amazing. So where are we now? Let me, I'm, I'm gonna mention one more landmark, which is the journal, the European Journal of Parental Alienation Practice. Here it is, 
It came out a week ago. This is the first issue. And it's a joint project of our friends in Ireland, the Parental Alienation in Europe, and our friends in Malta, the Institute of Family Therapy. These are the same people that created a, an accreditation program for parental alienation. And now uh, they have just created a master's degree, an accredited university-based master's degree program. And they have this journal. Obviously, their, ma their degree program and the journal go together. They reinforce each other. I think we're out of time. We do have a couple of future milestones that Demos provided to me and which, do you want to recite them? Yes. He's going to tell you real quickly what they are. We're not out of time. <laughs> no, I don't care. We're not out of time. OK. What's, what's the future wish list? Acknowledge that the construct for an alienation is described in the DSM. Child affected by parental relationship distress. It's right there and published in the American uh, in the Journal of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. There it is. It's right there. When we wrote this section in the DSM, we were looking at that. Acknowledge that the construct for alienation is admissible. There, there was this Greek guy in, in uh, Michigan who published this stuff in their own journal, in the, in the, in the uh, AFCC journal, showing, yeah, it's admissible. It's admissible all over the place. And acknowledge that the detractors of the construct parental alienation, publish misinformation in low-level papers and in junk journals. Now, Geffner is the editor of the Journal of uh, Child Custody. Okay, fun fact. The California Psychological, the, the, the Board of Psychology in California took a real close look at Mr. Uh, Dr. Geffner and said, you got to get your head examined. Don't forget that. The, uh, 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 the attorney for the, uh, for the Oath Keepers, remember Elmer just went down on seditious conspiracy charges? She was declared incompetent to stand trial. Fun fact, don't forget that. <laughs> Acknowledge that the construct for parental alienation has strong published peer-reviewed support. Harmon, Warshak, Lorandos, and Florian, just a year or so ago. Incredible arc of peer-reviewed publication, just in the last few years, 40% of all of the peer-reviewed qualitative and quantitative research has been published about parental alienation in, in uh, peer-reviewed journals, not schlock junk journals. I mean, when we, when we put that article together, it took us a year and a half to get that article done for developmental psychology. And th that review board kicked our butts when Jennifer and I debunked the, the Meyer silliness about giving the kids to uh, taking the kids away from protective parents and mothers, if they, if somebody brings it up, mothers automatically lose custody. The the journal uh, Psychology, Public Policy, and Law, I'm not, not a schlock journal, really took us to task and wanted to make sure every I was dotted, every T was crossed, all our stat was right, and it was, despite the silly rebuttals that come out. And acknowledge that the parents who are actually doing the violence are the alienators. That article just came out, uh, first author Amanda Sharples from uh, Canada, along with, along with Jennifer Harmon and uh, some other guy. So the, the point I'm making here is each of these memes that it's, you know, it's, it's not in the DSM, done, that, that uh, it's not admissible, done, that, that uh, 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 and, and where's this stuff coming from? It's coming from junk journals, and, and uh, it, there, isn't any, there isn't any support. There's strong peer-reviewed support for it. Don't take that kind of garbage. It's already all been rebutted. We need to acknowledge these things. That's our future milestone. Thank you.